audio and video pursuant to Zoom um, modifications for the open meeting law. So today we have a special uh, guest with us, Dr. Allen, and our flow for the, today's meeting will be a brief introduction by Dr. Provost, our Superintendent of Schools for Northampton Public Schools. We will have a presentation by Dr. Allen and we will have a beginning uh, question and answer session as well. Uh, we have some questions that have been compiled already from our committee and the community, so we will start there and then open the floor as we are able. So I will let Dr. Provost welcome Dr. Allen. Thank you. And we have another guest here today. Uh, we also have Mike Trzinski of Hessner Engineering. And I am going to have to leave before this meeting, so I will introduce both of our guests at once. So um, thank you both for being here. Welcome to our JLMC meeting. Um, as Lisa said, I'm the superintendent of schools for the district. And so I will uh, just let you know that we have um, school committee members, staff, parents, school physician, um, a wide variety of people from all walks of life on the, the meeting. So that might be important for you just to know. And then I will tell them a little bit about you. Um, first of all, let me say this group has been waiting a very long time um, with breath abated to hear both of you speak. So I'm not gonna say much, I wanna reserve the time for you. Welcome everybody to the special meeting of the JLMC and our guest speaker, Dr. Joseph Allen. Dr. Allen is an associate professor at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health and co-author of Healthy Buildings, How Indoor Spaces Drive Performance and Productivity. The JLMC had an opportunity to listen to a presentation that Dr. Allen provided to the Cambridge Public Schools, and we welcome his expertise and knowledge in a for a conversation of the Northampton Public Schools. And also joining us today, as I noted, is Mike Trzinski from Hessner Engineering Associates. Hessner has been engaged in analyzing our air exchange data as compiled by Nexus over the summer. And um, hopefully he will be able to uh, help answer some questions and, and share some insights from the analysis that he's already done. And so with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Allen. Okay, thanks for uh, inviting me. And I um, just want to check my notes that I was given about a 15 minute presentation and question and answers that sound about right. Okay, I'm happy to share some slides too, if that's okay too also. Yeah, okay. All right, so um, it's nice to join you. And um, my goal here is to just be a resource and hopefully answer some questions, present some frameworks we put together and some strategies. For background, I direct the Healthy Buildings Program at Harvard's T.H. Chan School of Public Health. My background is in exposure and risk science. I'm a certified industrial hygienist. This is the field that anticipates, recognizes, assesses, and controls hazards in the workplace. And I also uh, deputy director of our NIOSH funded education and research center on worker health and safety. All that to say um, is that the, my field is really around how do we assess hazards in the workplace and put in controls. Maybe most relevant to what we're seeing right now is that I, prior to joining Harvard and still today, I consult and advise on. Um, risk reduction strategies for, um, uh, sorry, for sick buildings. And I've done this for over 10 years with um, uh, sick schools, sick offices. I've done uh, disease outbreaks in hospitals. Some of these buildings where people had died uh, and we had to put in controls to keep everyone safe. So I say that because while the pandemic is unfamiliar to all of us, there are aspects that are familiar familiar aspect is we know how to keep people safe in buildings, kids and adults. Uh, one last thing just for background is that I've uh, been focusing on schools a lot lately, but advised across many uh, sectors of the economy, universities, biotech finance, the arts, I'm a special advisor to the Massachusetts uh, Supreme Court on reopening jury trials. And I'm a commissioner on the Lancet COVID-19 commission and I chair the task force there on safe work, safe schools and safe travel. So everything I'm gonna to share today is uh, available at the Harvard Healthy Buildings website. That's my program. If you look at forhealth.org or if you Google Harvard Healthy Buildings, you'll find it. We have a subpage dedicated to schools at schools.forhealth.org. I think an important place to start is the risk of school closures because I, um, when we think about exposure and risk, we have to think or take a wide lens and look at the cost of school closures or the risk. So we know 
that there are important risks to schools keeping kids out of school. Uh, we've seen virtual dropouts on the order of tens of thousands of kids right here in uh, Massachusetts, but this is happening across the country. Uh, there's food security issues. I had an op-ed today written with three other colleagues at the Harvard School of Public Health in USA Today talking about the billions of meals missed due to school closures, billions with a B, billions of meals missed. This is a, a real issue. Physical, security, uh, physical activity issues, socialization, learning. Uh, UNICEF reports that kids at home uh, due to school closures are at higher risk for abuse, neglect, exploitation, and violence. So we have to balance those risks or keep those risks in mind as we think about uh, the role of schools and recognize we have to uh, keep everyone safe in the school. So I want to be clear that when we talk about the who, um, that this is that these risk reduction strategies we're talking about are designed to keep both kids and adults uh, safe in schools. When it does come to kids, there are some important uh, benefits. Well, benefits is the wrong word. There are some things or ways that this virus has spared kids. This virus has not spared us globally in many ways, if any. One is that um, kids seem to be spared. And this is now consistent, really consistent data. They are less likely to get it than adults, certainly less likely to suffer the most severe consequences. The uh, likelihood of and the infection rate for kids is very, very low, and it's very, very high uh, as you get older. Uh, and it looks like kids are less likely to transmit if we take a step back and look at the full body of evidence there. Certainly the younger kids, there is some questions about uh, older teens looking more like adults in terms of transmissibility. Um, but my read of the science there is that looks like kids are less likely to transmit. And we can talk about our, this is from the large epidemiological data, and I'm happy to answer questions about mechanistically why that is. There are reasons why kids are less likely to transmit and also less likely to catch this in the first place. But I do want to emphasize the work we're doing, or my team has done, certainly focuses on both kids and adults. Two conditions precedent for reopening. Uh, one is the when to reopen based on community spread, and the other is what needs to be done in the school. So on the when to open, we have partnered with uh, other faculty at the Harvard School of Public Health and other uh, centers across Harvard, Harvard Center for Ethics, Harvard Global Health Institute, and we have a report on uh, resilient teaching and learning spaces that links to metrics that can be considered for when to reopen based on community spread. Second part is what to do in the schools, right? So it can't be schools as usual. We have to deploy risk reduction strategies. Here, my team released a 60-page report on risk reduction strategies for reopening schools. This came out in June. And we this is available on that website, schools.forhealth.org. And we broke it down into five different uh, sections of the report, places we have to focus on. Healthy policies, healthy activities, healthy classrooms, healthy buildings, and healthy schedules. I'm not gonna go through all of these right now, but happy to answer uh, around these. I'll really focus on the healthy buildings um, section of our report first. So if we think about the strategies for what we need to do in terms of the building, the engineering controls. Well, let me take a step back first. There's a couple of things that need to take place before we think about engineering controls. One is we have to understand how this virus is spread and then line up the appropriate controls. So early on, World Health Organization, CDC, highlighted close contact transmission and contaminated surfaces, or what we call fomite, fomite transmission. They de-emphasized airborne transmission. That was a mistake. Uh, I've been saying this since I wrote the first piece I wrote was in early February, saying airborne transmission is happening. I've written 21 op-eds since February in major newspapers calling this out. Airborne transmission is happening. It's unequivocal. That just means we line up additional controls. So for close contact, it's the basics. Distancing where we can, mask wearing for contaminated surfaces, hand washing is the most effective of those strategies. And for airborne, this is where the healthy building strategies come into play. Most important of which, again, for airborne spread is mask wearing because it stops or limits emissions at the source. Then we can think about a prioritization. Higher ventilation rates. So if anything's in the air, you want to dilute it out of the air through outdoor, higher outdoor air ventilation rates. Two, better filtration on the recirculated air if you can. Three, supplement that with portable air cleaners with HEPA filters. And then some basics here, which is we call commissioning in our field. You have an expert here. It sounds like you've hired an engineering firm. 
An en a commissioning is simply just giving your building a, a tune-up or a checkup like you would for your car, making sure the systems are working, making sure the fans are, are operating right, making sure the filters are installed correctly, that kind of thing. <clears throat> we released a guide on how to to assess ventilation. So it's actually it's really good to hear you have an engineer. Many schools are not uh, haven't done this step, um, but in an effort to look at different strategies and how these work together. My team actually went out to many different schools over the weekends and in the summer and showed them how to measure ventilation rate and filtration rate. And then we put out a five-step guide for how to do this so other schools could learn or do this themselves. And actually Cambridge, I heard, uh, used this guide and started to measure ventilation rates in their classrooms uh, in maybe in August and September. So the guide's pretty simple. We tried to demystify this a bit. These are um, you know, techniques we've used in my field for forever. Uh, some real basics here, and I'll walk through them a little bit, but you're, happy, you're welcome to read through the guide. Um, but first and foremost, you can measure ventilation rates, right? So this is an, uh, an airflow capture hood, also called a bolometer. You simply put it up against the vent and it measures how much air is flowing into the room, right? How much outdoor air. So in this case, the 444 is 444 cubic feet per minute. And that's a measure of how much air is coming in, CFM. And then in this classroom, you know, but it's hard to measure that with a bolometer. It's hard to measure something like operable windows and how much air comes in through opening windows. So we did another set of tests using a buildup of carbon dioxide. You use dry ice, build up the level of CO2 in the room. Then you get rid of the source, remove the dry ice, open up the windows or whatever you want to test and watch how quickly the CO2 decays or leaves the room. And from that, you can assess the ventilation rate. So in this case, we just open up the windows you see in the back, six inches, one window is broken. We just, as is, we test it as is. And we found that um, this can lead to several air changes, many air changes per hour of clean air. So for example, this is a graph looking at time on the horizontal axis and carbon dioxide on the vertical axis. So after we increase the level of CO2, we, oh, we turn on the ventilation system, and we find that we got 1.6 air changes per hour of clean air. Then we open up the windows and we get a total of four air changes, and we open the doors too for some cross breeze, and we get six air changes per hour. This is just, a, or five and a half air changes per hour. So this is just illustrative. We did this for many different classrooms, but I wanted to show what it looks like. We can look at the slope of that curve and estimate the air exchange rate from that. This is a practice that's done all the time. And we do that, well, when we do that, we find, you know, depending on the room, depending on the ventilation system, but simply opening up windows a couple inches can give you, you know, um, well, sometimes over 10 air changes per hour. In this case, you've got another maybe three air changes total on top of whatever this unit ventilator was doing. Importantly, we need targets here. And this is where there's been a real failing um, uh, in terms of national leadership and even from the standard setting bodies around ventilation is that no one has set a target. It's quite unbelievable, actually. So in the summer, we were working with schools and they said, well, what should we target in terms of air changes per hour? And these are the recommendations we came up with. Four to six air changes per hour, four being good, six being ideal. And for reference, an air change per hour, let's say a typical US home has half an air change per hour. So every two hours, the full volume of air is replaced. Six air changes is every 10 minutes. Of course, you're removing some of the clean air, so the pollutant, so it's the equivalent volume of the room is, is replaced every um, 10 minutes. So that helps reduce the amount of, uh, of uh, anything that's in the air. If you're meeting code for schools, it's three air changes per hour, just about. Uh, but most schools don't. Across the US, most schools get about one and a half. The average is about one and a half air changes per hour. So it varies, of course. So anyway, that's some guidance. And I want to just clear, uh, change one thing, or mention one thing here, and I'll, maybe on the last slide here for some additional resources. But I want to talk about the bottom right there. We talk about portable air cleaners for classrooms. So in the event you're, you can't bring in more outdoor air, you're, you can't handle higher filtration, like a MERV 13 filter on your ventilation system, you can supplement this with a portable air cleaner with a HEPA filter. And we have a tool, first we have a, a white paper that describes how these work and why they work. And then we have a tool on our website that helps you select the right size air cleaner for your classroom.
based on the size of the classroom. So you could imagine a scenario, I'll actually take the scenario from the school we measured in. Outdoors was bringing in one and a half air change per hour. The circulated air was giving you another one and a half air changes through a good filter. So you're at three, and then they use a portable air cleaner for an additional two or three air changes per hour to hit their target. So that's what uh, some schools are doing if their mechanical system um, can't handle the, mess, the needed air changes per hour. Filtration is also becomes more important as the winter or the depths of winter hit because it becomes harder to open up your windows. You can still do it. I'm a big fan of everyone uh, getting comfortable being uncomfortable, wearing coats and hats, opening up windows even a little bit can uh, create a lot of air changes. Um, but some of the ventilation systems simply can't handle higher volumes of air uh, that they'll have to heat. So in that case, filtration becomes uh, more important because it can fill up the gap uh, created by lower ventilation rates. All right, so I'm happy to answer questions. A lot of resources, more resources on our site here. You see some of these 20 questions everyone should ask before sending kids back to school. Uh, we have links to that document on when to open. The full risk reduction report is there. Tools for portable air cleaners. We have this translated into Spanish. Uh, all of the guidance documents, uh, all written five op-eds with other colleagues on the why, the what, the when, and the how to do this in schools um, since June. And those are all on that site too. It's at the bottom there, schools.4health.org. So thank you. And I'm happy to uh, answer any questions you have. Thank you, Dr. Allen. I um, am going to have uh, Tony Kuzniers, our facilities director, start, uh, start us off with some questions and answers. So Tony. Do you guys just mind not screen sharing for this portion? It helps me to take my notes. I was gonna say the same, thank you very much. Sure. Uh, thank you, Dr. Allen, for the presentation. Um, I think we've been aware of your, your research and your data for most of the summer. I think between our district um, and then our facility group in the state, MFAA, which I'm a part of, I think we've been sharing and using your information to help guide um, a lot of the district uh, policies and practices. I wanted to talk a little bit about what we're doing now and then ask you a couple questions on potentially if there's anything that we can do better or anything that we can do differently. Um, we've used a lot of your guidance already. So we'll start with filtration and then kind of go into EMS schedules. So we did purchase and have installed uh, MERV 13 filters. Um, as you probably know, they're very difficult to source. Um, thankfully, we're able to. So we're using them in all of our unit ventilators and then building uh, systems as well. Um, they were replacing MERV 7.8s and 9s, which we used previously. So we're, we're monitoring performance. So I've got some concerns about some of our older equipment um, but for now, they seem to be working um, and we'll continue monitoring that. So along with that filtration level, we've got energy management systems in every one of our buildings, um, ranging from new to, you know, 10 to 15 years old, Johnson control systems and automated logic systems. So we're able to run purge cycles, you know, several hours before people come in and then running them several hours after people leave the building. Um, we've also were able to control fresh air dampers during the shoulder season, which we're kind of, we're heading out of. We were able to run those at 100% open across all of our buildings. So as a way of increasing uh, fresh air intake, we, along with that, we're opening windows and we purchased uh, window fans like a recirculating window fan to, to aid in that as well. So as we're heading into colder weather, you know, we're going back to our normal airflow damper settings, which modulate between 10 and 20% um, on the equipment in the settings that we have. We do, we're doing that obviously for several reasons, just to inform everyone here. Um, it puts our buildings at risk of frozen pipes and flooding. So if we have a, a temperature degree change anywhere be, anywhere below freezing. Um, if anyone is familiar with what happened at our middle school last year, we had multiple pipes burst in our unit events for the same cause. 
um, it flooded uh, a quarter of our building. So that's why we can't run them at 100%. So we go back to modulating them as we have been. Um, so along with that, we also do have uh, portable HEPA filters. Um, we are able to source some of these pretty far back in the summer. So as of now, we do have those as well. And along with that, we also are using CO2 monitors, individual CO2 monitors in our classrooms. We're using uh, a 600 part per million threshold. And that is gonna be maybe one of my questions. See if you can say if that's too low or what you recommend as a range of what we should be using. Um, um, I think that's kind of a good synopsis of, of what we've done so far. Um, I'll get into to a couple of my questions. So with regard, uh, let me back up one step, for, sorry. Um, along with the engineer, Mike, that we have on throughout the summer, we've hired a, a HVAC consulting firm that measured all of our air exchange rates in our classrooms. We've expanded that to other rooms in every building, um, offices, tried to capture offices, conference rooms, libraries, anywhere that we're able to do it. Um, they used a hood system and, and measured and monitored airflow in all the spaces that we could get to. Um, and then we've got an ongoing report that we've been gathering and measuring all of the airflow data, you know, in ACH levels so that we can use that as a guide for our buildings. So the first question is, in regard to our ACH or air change per hour number and using portable HEPA filters, what can we expect as a typical increase of that number? Yeah, so um, first, let me reflect on some of this, what you just said, you know, I've been, so I'm really glad to hear that you're using the report and I can just tell from what I just heard that um, you took it seriously because I've been talking with a lot of schools and some are doing aspects of, aspects of this or some of it, but um, uh, from what I just heard, it sounds like you're doing the right steps. First, I think it was important to get someone in there to measure, find out what your system can do, that's the checkup. Uh, not all systems can handle MERV 13. So that's really quite good. I think that puts you in a much better place and we can talk about why. Uh, you already purchased the portable air cleaners and you're using the 100% damper during the open, during the damper, uh, during the uh, shoulder season. So um, first, I think that's really quite good. Um, and the CO2 monitors, I, I, there are very few that are doing that, but I like that. And I'll tell you about some of the potential pitfalls of that so that as you move into the winter, uh, the interpretation of the CO2 could be more accurate. But the question was on air change per hour and portable air cleaners with a HEPA filter and how do you know how many air changes you're getting, right? So the tool we have will be really helpful and I'll describe how you can do this, but uh, it's actually a simple calculation. We'll walk through it. It might sound complicated, but it's actually really straightforward. If you think about every portable air cleaner or most have a what's called a clean air delivery rate. That's measured in CFM, cubic feet per minute. So let's take the cubic feet per minute, and I'll give you an example. And a rule of thumb is you want 300 CFM for every 500 square feet, but it depends on your ventilation standard. So that's not a, that's not a hard cutoff. But here, let's walk through that example. So you have 300 CFM times 60. That'll give you cubic feet per hour, right? So that's 18,000. Divided by the volume of the classroom. So let's take 500 square foot, eight foot ceilings, right? So now it's 18,000 divided by 4,000, four and a half air changes per hour. That's the calculation, that's it. How much clean air delivery versus the volume of the space is air changes per hour. Now you have to take into account, or you should, what your mechanical ventilation system's doing. Remember you have outdoor air coming in, that's gonna change to 10 or 20% as you go to colder weather for good reasons right? So you don't destroy your system. You count the recirculated air going through the high efficiency MERV 13 filter. And then you count the portable air cleaner. That's all clean air delivery. And, and so that would all go in the numerator there divided by the volume of the room, right? So it, let's take um, the classroom I, uh, I did in uh, my town. So they had 400 CFM coming in from outdoor. 
plus 400 recirculated, but they did not have a MERV-13. So we did not count that as clean air. So they only got to count the 400 CFM divided by the volume of the room. That's their air changes per hour. Um, for a MERV-13, so first, um, for those who aren't familiar, MERV is just a rating system for filters. MERV-8 is typical uh, for most buildings. It kind of protects the equipment, captures maybe 20% of the particles that we're interested in for this virus. Um, but a MERV-13 will get you close to 80%, 80%. So we suggest counting 80% of the recirculated air as clean air for that reason. Right, so, and it's in that guide, if you wanna walk through that guidance document. So let's take that example from my classroom. I don't know your numbers. 400 CFM from outdoor plus 400 is recirculated through a MERV 13. So that's only 80% efficient. So you'd add 320. So the total clean air coming through the unit ventilator is 400 plus 320. That's your numerator divided by the volume of the room. Does that, um, does that make, Sensors, um, yeah. So, so it's a, but so if you think about what size portable air cleaner you need, it really depends on what else your system is doing. I think one other question to just tag on to that. I think I watched or you talked about it a little bit with the Cambridge presentation is that these are are stackable in a sense, where you can multiply the effect. If you have a bigger room and you use two filters, you you plug that into the calculation as well. Is that correct? Yeah, it's additive. And, and so that's additive from the outdoor air, recirculated air. Um, you know, if you got a portable air clean with HEPA and you thought it was too loud um, and you wanted two smaller units or you wanted two units running at half speed, um, that's, it's all additive. Yeah. You simply add it onto the calculation of clean, how much clean air is coming in in terms of CO2. Okay. Can you speak a little bit about the CO2 levels? Um, and our use of the CO2 monitors and, and maybe some levels that you'd recommend or what we should be looking at as far as part per million numbers. Yeah, so CO2, that's great that you're doing that. You have to remember that um, the CO, so taking a step back, we're the main source of CO2 indoors and we can use CO2 as a proxy for ventilation rate you can either use it in two different ways. One, like I showed you where we look at the decay. So after we use dry ice because the building was empty, but after uh, students left the room, you could follow the decay curve and estimate how much air exchange you had. That's one approach. The other one is what we call steady state CO2. Room occupied, you know the number of people in the space um, and you can use CO2 to know how much outdoor air you're getting. And this is also in that, uh, if you wanna see the formulas, they'll look confusing at first, but there's no really crazy math in there. You look at the CO2, the steady state. And for example, that's where your rule of thumb 600 came from. Typical building, um, people use a thousand parts per million. Most schools, it's at 1500 parts per million, not as the cutoff, that's what it is, because they're underventilated. Um, but here's where it gets tricky, because I think you're over, you're, you're, over, what's the right word, what's the right word? You're over specifying, you're, the 600 is, is overdone for this reason. Remember the, the anything through that goes through a filter won't impact CO2. So as you change your damper position down to 10 or 20%, your CO2 levels will go up. But because you're running air through a MERV 13 filter and then plus portable HEPA units, the higher CO2 is not going to influence the total air exchange rate, right? Because air exchange rate is a combination of ventilation and filtration. And filtration doesn't impact CO2. Now, you could use the CO2 numbers to say, well, you know, how can I, can I verify without opening up my unit ventilator, how much outdoor air is coming in? Is it really 20% damper position? So it can be useful. You just have to be cautious. I'd say the 600 ppm, because you have better filtration, is I would say too aggressive. In fact, as you go to 10 or 20%, um, I doubt you'll be at 600 parts per million. And that would be worrisome, not worrisome. It would be something you have to track if you didn't have filtration happening, right? Great, thank you. Um, two other real kind of short questions to build off of it. So a lot of what we talked about are classrooms. Um, can you speak to a little bit about larger spaces 
uh, gymnasiums, libraries, cafeterias. You know, we've struggled to measure these. Um, we've been able to actually using our, our con you know, consultant, using a lift and getting up into our, our duct work and measuring them. But what is, just explain a little bit about air change per hour as it relates to these larger spaces versus a classroom. Yeah, I don't, uh, the air change per hour works really well in a classroom, doesn't work so well in a larger space for that reason. And, and really we should also take a step back and uh, think about how the ventilation standards are actually set. So ventilation standards are set by a standard setting body called ASHRAE, or the HVAC uh, standard setting body. And um, they, they set ventilation rates for every place we spend time indoors, for, for courts, for schools, uh, retail shops, restaurants. And so um, it's done in two ways. It's a combination of a, a ventilation rate per area and per person. So you can imagine if a place only has one person in it, you still have to put in enough air. So they base it on a per area. They tend to simplify it and give a one number CFM per person. You can convert that to air changes per hour, but here's why it doesn't make sense. You're not gonna get five or six air changes per hour in your gym, no way, or your auditorium. You don't need to because you have other things happening. You, you have a larger volume space. And so, if, especially if people are wearing masks, most of the, particles are generated, right? You're going to have thermal plumes and you have a buoyancy effect where um, a, a lot of the air is going to go up, mix, the mechanical system will help dilute some of that. But it's not like you have eight foot ceilings in a classroom or nine foot ceilings where everything's just going up and kind of circulating and stays in the breathing zone. So you get some benefit there in the larger volume space. Um, so I wouldn't recommend using the air change per hour target. You're not going to hit it. There's no way. Um, in your, in your, you're not going to hit it without like industrial size fans being brought in. It's just not necessary. So you can think about, you know, keeping occupant density uh, relatively low or not low, but, you know, sufficient where keep, people can spread out, but you have a large volume space. Same thing. You want the ventilation system at full bore as best you can, recognizing that right in the winter, this is going to have to change better filters that will help. Uh, can you open the gym door uh, to get in some outdoor air, create a, try and create a cross breeze. All of that will help. Great, thank you very much. Um, those are all the questions that I have for now. Um, our engineer, Mike, is also all joining us. I don't know, Mike, if you wanna ask any questions or if you wanna speak a little bit further. Um, no, no questions. Um, everything I have here really dovetails into what Dr. Allen's been discussing. Um, as, as you mentioned, Tony, you had a firm come through and record airflow rates at all of your equipment. Um, it was supply air, not the outdoor air portion, total air going into each room. Um, you also mentioned that when they did that, that was when you had your older filters, right? The Merv 8s or 7s, whatever. So mm -hmm. we, we readjusted that because the Merv 13s obviously have a higher pressure drop. So for every space, we have a reduced CFM of supply airflow. Um, one analysis we were looking at with the air changes and again, we're just looking, one, one part of this is total air changes um, based on the filtered air going into the space. And at most of your buildings, you're in the range of three to say 10 air changes per hour. We also looked at the HEPA units that you're adding to all these rooms, which are 400 CFM each. And those are giving it anywhere from one to eight or nine additional air changes per hour. From the ASHRAE perspective, um, which Dr. Allen mentioned, their recommendation is to provide these HEPA units, especially if you can't get MERV 13 filters in your equipment. Fortunately, you were, so these HEPA units are only helping what you're already doing. As we fold all this info together, I'll be able to give you total air changes with the HEPA units on top of your existing equipment. The other thing we've been looking at is your, your ventilation, your outdoor air for all your spaces. That's where we seem to be falling short here, at least based on what ASHRAE is um, giving us for calculations. Again, I'm, I'm repeating a lot of what was already said here, but we went through every classroom based on age group, the occupancy density, people per thousand square feet. 
Uh, we have a certain CFM per square foot for each room, then a certain CFM per occupant. Figured out what we need for outside air based on that calculation. And then we looked at it a few different ways. Um, you know, with damper positions, for instance, we looked at what you would be getting for outdoor air at a 10% open damper, 20%. And we're really just not hitting any of these target numbers. A lot of them are maybe 20% of what we need from ASHRAE. So we looked at it one other way and that's backing it out um, to look at a mixed air temperature. And I know you brought up concerns with freezing. I don't know what controls you have in the unit ventilators, if you have freeze stats and um, those provisions already. But we looked at what is the maximum amount of outdoor air we can bring in on a design day when it's negative two or negative four degrees outside and keep our coil entering air temperature at 40 degrees. And when we look at those numbers, we get a handful of classrooms are, are now satisfied. They're now gonna meet ASHRAE, um, but I'd say we're still looking at at least 50% or more um, in each building that even maximizing the amount of outdoor air through this existing equipment, we're just not gonna be able to hit those targets. So we're, we're gonna continue to fine tune this and put it into a presentation so that you guys can see this in an easily readable fashion. Um, should be wrapping this up within the next couple days. I don't know if you have any questions on what I ran through so far. No, that's good, thank you. Dr. Allen, maybe can you answer or just give us some thoughts on what that means for us, how we can better deal with that or things that we should change or modify. Oh, I, I, it's hard for me to weigh in without seeing the report or the actual data. I'd like to yeah. see really what's going on a bit more um, and hear about it. So it's hard to fully weigh in. I think there's always a strat, there's always something you can do. And this is where I think the portable air cleaner becomes a solution when other things are challenging. That's plug and play. Uh, and really quite simple. I would also mention that the single, mo again, the single most effective strategy is masking. So that's going to have the biggest uh, impact. And you have the combination of the, so when the MERV 13 filters are on most, or if not all of the units, it sounded like from the opening when you presented it, Tony? Correct. Right, so you're getting any of the, as long as the volume of air is not dropping off significantly. So it depends on the volume of air that's still coming through those but the capture efficiency for the particles is actually pretty good and should be counted towards um, your clean air, total clean air in the room, clean air delivery rate, I should say. I see that school, uh, school committee member Voss has her hand raised for a question and I will um, continue on after she asks what she wants to, Susan. Thank you so much. I actually have a question for each of you, if that's okay. And I really appreciate your both being with us. I'm really grateful for that. Um, Dr. Allen, my question for you is, we've had conversations about what is the best procedure for where kids might eat lunch. And so right now, I believe the plan is they eat in classrooms um, and obviously masks are not on. And I, I'm trying to balance that between the idea of a bigger space, like a cafeteria or a gym because there's so much more air in there, although it is moving a little slower. So I'm just curious if you've thought about that and what you think the best compromise is for where kids eat lunch. And if it's okay, if you could answer that, I also have a question for the engineer, please. Sure, yeah, so it's a really good question. Um, I think a key strategy, so one, I think we should use any, be get creative and use every possible space we can use uh, in, in the school to, to spread kids out. I think that's good. I do think the, um, Physical distancing is important, but the, let's call it the social or the group distancing, keeping groups apart is smart. This way, if you have a case, it doesn't rip through the whole school or the whole school doesn't have to be quarantined, but it might be a smaller uh, pocket of people. So I think that's important. Um, the in-class, you know, I, I, this is not um, great for kids, but, um, uh, you know, if talking, which you'll all laugh, uh, can be kept to a minimum when masks are off. So the short time 
when they're doing that or um, if possible. I know everyone's covering that. I have three kids, so I'm not um, a, naive, uh, a naive dad saying that. Um, but really it's a mission rate. So if the volume can be kept down if you don't have 100 kids in the same space or so in the classroom uh, as spread out as they can. So, um, but that's a function of, you know, emission rates versus removal. It's the real basics here. So mass down. The other thing I would say is during those times, that's where the teacher, the adult needs to be at even greater distance, right? So the risks, like we said to kids are actually quite low. All, all kinds of risks, risk of getting it, risk of transmitting it, risk of suffering from it. So for adults, it's a different risk profile. So that if we think about the whole risk paradigm, the, the higher risk scenario is the time when masks are off, obviously. Um, so I would encourage you to say, look, masks can be off while you're actively eating and drinking, otherwise masks go back on. And at that point, the teacher should, uh, I would recommend it being even for, or the adult, whoever's providing the supervision, uh, be extra distance. I think that's smart. Maybe next to an open window. I think that makes a lot of sense. You can use uh, the portable air cleaner in creative ways. Um, I, I really think, you know, look, uh, you know, the, the winters are horrible in New England um, for the cold, but, uh, you know, even a couple inches can really help bring in a lot more air. And if that means sweaters, you know, you see pictures from 1918, we had kids outside and in sweatshirts and, and wool hats. Um, it's, there's nothing, uh, there's no good way to do it this year, but you know, if we're a little colder or comfortable, we're all wearing three layers of long johns. Um, I prefer that. I'd like, I'd like windows to stay open. Or even if it's there, you know, that period when, when they're eating lunch and masks are down, um, you know, if that's a time when everyone's a little colder, I would say uh, do it. Thank you so much. Um, Lisa, is okay if I ask Tim a question too? Um, I'm looking for you in the grid, Tim. <laughs> um, thank you as well. My question is, I'm really curious about the, um, I'm going to be really interested to read your report and think about the outside air issue that you're bringing up. Um, we've had a number of people come talk to us about that. And my understanding is it's also related to the number of people. So I guess my question is, when you say we're having rooms struggle to meet that outside air, it relates to whatever occupancy. So are we considering, you know, in this hybrid plan we're talking about, it would be half the normal occupancy. Um, how are you um, thinking about that in terms of, are you coming up with a number of people that can be in the room to meet the ASHRAE requirement? Or are you just saying in normal times, we aren't meeting it? Thanks. We started out with the occupancy densities right from the mechanical code. Um, most of these classrooms are 25 people per thousand square feet. Um, from there, we're looking also, you know, what would the allowable occupancy base that be based on these various damper positions? And it's, it's just not realistic because, uh, you know, if I start with a classroom that had 18 people when I calculate it per the code. Now when I look at a damper position of 20% open, it, it's down to six students. You know, you, you can't function like that. That's not taking into account the uh, clean air through the better filter, is that right? Not at all, no. This is only looking at outside air requirements per the mechanical code, which is based on ASHRAE. Yeah, right. So ASHRAE is not giving you the, not you, I mean us, the, the, the tools to deal with this the right way, which, you know, if you had a MERV-8 filter, I'd say, yeah, the recirculated air shouldn't be counted as clean air, but because you have the recircul, it's just like a portable system, but your system is recirculating air. Now it's not going through a HEPA filter, so you don't get near 100% removal, but you, if you get 80%, that's pretty good. So in terms of your total clean air delivery rate, it's the combination, it's the fraction from outdoor plus the fraction recirculated through a good filter plus whatever's coming through the portable unit. Sorry, can I just, I, I've been part of these conversations. So the piece that's missing is, do we know how much air is being recirculated through that MERV 13 filter? Do we have measurements of that? We have a good estimate based on damper position. It's not exactly linear, you know, because pressure drops vary with the damper position. But um, if we're saying 10% of the damper's 10% open, it's gonna be pretty close to 10% of the total supply. 
Um, now, what Dr. Allen just mentioned about accounting for, I guess, an 80% effectiveness of the MERV-13 filters, we can plug that in here, um, add that to our outside air that we're getting, add it to the HEPA, and back out a number of occupants pretty easily. Thank you, Mike. Um, I do have a question from a community member, if we could go on to that. And then uh, noting the time, it is 4.20, so we will have just a few more minutes for maybe two or three more questions. So community members asking, if we understand that the building ventilation is a critical piece of the puzzle, along with the health screenings, mask wearing, physical distancing, and the monitoring of community spread, Will you please talk about how you see these working together into a metric for comprehensive risk mitigation? Well, I think it is uh, combined. It is a comprehensive. I don't know if there's a, a the metric. I mean, the goal is to keep uh, cases out. I, I think the reality is um, there's no such thing as zero risk um, anywhere in anything we do, and certainly not during a pandemic. I would say too is where I started my presentation, we also have to think about the risks of school closures and the costs and the consequences of that decision. And we're facing the prospect of many districts of kids out of school for an entire year. So there will be devastating public health consequences to that decision as well that I, I'm concerned about. Um, and so if we think about the holistic, so that's one, but if we think about the, 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 the risk reduction strategies we're talking about and not just the ventilation healthy buildings, it's hand washing, um, it's, I think the first and foremost, sounds like what you're doing here, creating a culture of health, safety, and shared responsibility. The school has a job to play, the district has a job to play, teachers have a role to play, kids have a role, parents have a role, caregivers have a role. Community has a role to prioritize schools over reopening other aspects of our economy right now. I mean, we have to really think about this shared responsibility and what we're trying to do first and foremost in this state. Um, that said, and thinking about risk in the school, there isn't one metric. I would say you, you, you apply all of these tools and we know we can keep risk around. How do we know it? This is what's working in healthcare and in, in, in hospitals. They can't physically distance. They're high risk populations, high risk of people coming in who are actively infectious. They're largely doing it through proper masking, hand washing, and these healthy building strategies, ventilation, filtration. Hospitals take care of their buildings really well. So that's largely how they're doing it. We also have data from schools across Europe that stayed open and it doesn't look like, shouldn't say that, the data show that schools are not these hotbeds of transmission. They're not increasing the transmission. We have many examples from YMCAs and camps and community daycare centers that stayed open through the, the stretch that was really bad here in New England in the fall. I mean, in the spring, pardon me. Um, and now we have data from many schools staying open. Uh, and uh, in, the, in the rest of the US uh, that started to open in August through September, and we have all the data in October. So we know this can work. Um, the challenge, I think, let's say from a population statistics standpoint, is that it's really hard to see the denominator here, the what's working. Because cases in schools will rise to the top of the news as they should, we need to learn from them. But the country's not systematically collecting data. It's a big problem. We're not collecting data on what's working too. So we really have a poor grasp of the denominator here, the what's working part of this. And I think it's a real, it's a real problem. Um, but in terms of a metric, there isn't one, any one thing I would track. I'd say we need to do all of these things um, and it's gonna be, require us to be vigilant. But again, I, the, the most important, again, for all the risk models that, that, were, that have been built, my teams, other, other faculty have built these, uh, the universal masking is what will really drive down um, risk. And that's because this idea that even imperfect masks, you know, say, well, nobody has an N95 like healthcare does, and we still have an, health, an N95 shortage, which is just um, irresponsible, grossly irresponsible. But even with imperfect masks, let's take a three layer surgical mask and you have a 70% efficiency. Right? Well, it's not an N95, but if it's universal masking, everything has to go through two filters. So let's say that I'm sick and infectious and I cough out 100 particles. My mask captures 70 and 30 escape into space, right? 30 now dilute over time or get captured in the filters, right? Some fraction. So that's the engineering controls come in this middle space. But let's say for this example, 
nothing's happening with ventilation or filtration. It hits your mask. It's a close contact scenario, okay? There's no, ventilation's not gonna do much. Well, now those 30 particles hit another 70% efficient mask, capturing 21, nine get through. It's over 90% efficiency through the dual masking, even at close contact. Now, when you spread people out further and you have the engineering controls intervening on the particles that made it through the mask, you further reduce what hits that second mask. So this is where the, the power of universal masking comes in, even, not, even without people in N95s. Um, and that's the, the real strength. And some of the surgical masks actually do even better than 70%. You get to 80% efficient mass, you're over 95% joint efficiency. So just want to stress that as the, you know, as a, as a key, key control here. Obviously, I think, I think in Massachusetts, we're, we've been on the ball here in terms of uh, the importance of masking. This is not everywhere. Thank you. Um, we are getting close to the end of Dr. Allen's time with us and we can take one or two more questions if anyone present has one that they would like to ask at the moment. No? Was that a hand, Brett? Just stretching my fingers. Okay. <laughs> Well, then um, Kate has her hand raised. Kate. Thank you, Dr. Allen, for joining us. Um, my name is Kate. I'm a school nurse um, at the Leeds Elementary School. I'm wondering if you could comment at all, um, provide any reassurance to the folks who would actually be working with the children. People ask me a lot about you know, children don't stay six feet away. And I try to reassure people that, you know, most people most of the time are wearing their masks. There are kids who are taking them off sometimes and kids, you know, aren't, no, one, no one's perfect. Um, but is there anything reassuring you can say, given what you've heard about what our school district is doing um, about those children who just aren't gonna be able to stay six feet away from their teachers or classmates? Yeah, so it's a good question. Um, and um, I've worked with a bunch of school nurses, so uh, thank you. We, we do a terrific job. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm less concerned about the physical distancing in schools for kids for that reason that kids are, they transmit it less, particularly the younger kids. And with masking, um, this can really help. So, so if we think about, um, and, and again, the data from the hospital systems where, where distancing is just not possible all the time. Uh, and we've really, really significantly dropped the risk for healthcare workers. It's not non-zero and that's a high risk environment with people who are actively shedding the virus and multiple people shedding. So um, that's what gives me the, the, some confidence there. In fact, I agree with um, uh, the Department of Education and the early reports, American Academy of Pediatrics that the six foot distancing shouldn't be a barrier to returning kids to school. I really think that. Um, in terms of masking, this is where I think that the training, the reinforcement uh, comes in, right? It's not going to be perfect, but we need it to be as perfect as can be. And this is the reinforcement that goes to everyone at home. It's not just wear a mask, it's let's talk about it. How do you wear it? It's gotta be above the bridge of your nose. Down here, it's not for you protecting others, right? You're protecting the community and they need to be fit as, as, as well as possible, meaning you know, tight to the face, not just flapping around. And so I know, right, I have young kids too, so I, I know the challenges here. I have to say though, the kids that I've worked with and been around here, they do a pretty good job. It's like my kids wear it now and they don't even have to when they're outside, but they just, it's like become part of what they're doing. Um, so, I, you know, hopefully with that, you know, the creating that culture of the shared responsibility that can try to help there. It's kind of what we do at, for construction sites. Now I know that's adults, but it's every morning is started with a, a safety message, a safety meeting. There are people walking around with the safety vests, you know, it's not policing, not auditing, but it's this culture of health. Everyone's trying to protect each other. Um, I actually, it's in our report. I think every morning should start with the safety meeting, the safety message. Um, uh, and really, I think that can go a long way. So anyway, short answer is I don't think the six foot um, distancing is what would concern me if these other controls are in place. Uh, last two questions, Nancy first and then Karen. Hi, thank you so much. This has been um, really helpful. I have two kids um, in the elementary school and so um, the information is just really, really helpful. I'm wondering, um, 
Dr. Allen and, and also uh, wh whoever else, will there be some sort of calculation in the report as to how many kids can be in a particular classroom? Is that gonna be recalculated? I know at one point, um, I think it was Mike said the numbers were low to six, but then Dr. Allen said, well, you have to factor in some of the filters. And so is there going to be a recommendation per classroom of how many children can be in each particular classroom? This is Mike, we will produce a document based on this mechanical code and ash rate calculation along with the air changes that will show that information. Um, I don't know that that's the number you need to stick to based on Dr. Allen's input. I'm looking at it straight from these, you know, what the code says in ASHRAE, not all these other considerations with masks and everything else. So Dr. Allen, if, if, if it's, if you get that vent number that you were talking about, does it matter if there's six kids in the classroom or 20 kids in the classroom? Is it just okay if you, as long as you have that air circulation number? Yes, it's a really good question. And I should have opened by saying what my role is here. I, you know, I, I'm not even quite sure. Someone reached out to me and asked if I'd come to this. So I'm not uh, hired by the town. I'm not really working with anybody. I am not working with anybody in the town. Um, and I understand the challenges of your engineer, right? This is a lot of companies are facing this because they design and operate towards code. And it gets very different if you start to say, well, let's change from code because of a risk, you know, infectious disease risk. So a lot of people don't want to move off of that. In fact, that's why we spent a weekend over the summer deriving these air change numbers so schools would have a target. Otherwise, there's no target out there. It's a real, it's a problem. But to your point, um, you can... In fact, the, the, you can adjust the occupancy based on the ventilation rate. Absolutely, that's how it normally is. It's the per area and per person number, right? So if you have fewer people, you have a minimum to cover the area. And as the number of people change, it fluctuates how much air you have to bring in. That's the normal way it's done. I think that's fine. What we've done with the air change per hour is disentangle that. We just said, look, if you have six people in there or 10, our air change per hour are actually more conservative. It just says, this is the target. You know, uh, I think it was Mike mentioned the ash rate default density of 25 per thousand square feet. We just, that's the, that's what we designed the air change per hour too. So we're saying full, fully loaded classroom according to typical design specs, the four to six air change per hour is a good target. If you go fewer students than that, you just, it's even more conservative. So in other words, I wouldn't scale, my number is already protected. Of the, of a fully occupied space under code density. That's how we derived it. We thought it'd be safer just to say, look, let's say here's the target air change per hour. Knowing that some kids come in and out, you might have an extra adult come in or out. Let's just go with an air change that covers us. Now, some schools have said, well, that's too conservative. We want to scale it because if we only have a room with ten people, we don't want to lose operation of that room. And I think that's fair. I, I think it's. I think. That's how it normally goes. It's normally scalable. As Mike was talking about, that's typical how you would do it. You would scale it and say, here's how much air is coming in. This room can handle 10 people. Thank you. I can yeah, so tell it's, you. It's a, bit, it's a judgment. You know, this is, um, none of this is written down except for the code stuff. And the code doesn't talk about infectious disease, not outside of hospitals. I don't think you're going to have an issue being in that four to six air ch change per hour range. If we're looking at it from that perspective, you're, you're just about there everywhere. Yeah, I think with the filters, I mean, to be honest, a lot of the schools I'm dealing with, their systems can handle MERV 13. And so that gives you some benefit because you're actually filtering the air where most schools are handling the MERV 8. Now you did hear the opening comment that you have built, they're already, see, I can tell that they're on it because, um, you have to monitor your systems over time because that's going to put a strain on your system. It, 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 put, it, it costs more energy and more, en uh, more effort from the fan to push air through a better filter. So it sounds like they're able to do it, but it's something you're going to monitor over time. It might blow out a fan or something, but so you got to just stay on it um, and just make sure your systems don't run down. Uh, and you'll know it if they do run down, but um, you get that benefit that mo a lot of schools I'm talking about don't have in terms of their able to handle the MERV 13. And Karen, last question, and then we will wrap up. Hi, thank you. 
Um, you spoke about how efficient the three layer surgical masks are, Dr. Allen, and I'm wondering if you could speak to how that compares to um, homemade cloth masks that the students are wearing. Yeah, so um, it really depends on the fabric and the weave. And there's some, I tell you, it just got announced today that ASTM will start to, um, which is a standard setting uh, body, will start to, I hear they're going to set standards for masks, which is a good thing. And we didn't have any standards for masks until WHO, World Health Organization, released some guidance in June. Um, but here's, here's what we know, you know, the, the, even the homemade mass, so more layers is better than fewer. So if you have a mass that's homemade, a lot of the manufactured ones at least have two layers at this point. That's a minimum two layers is really great. Um, and, and it varies based on particle size. So it's not so straightforward to give an exact answer, but even a simple cloth mask um, at a minimum is usually like 50% effective, which sounds terrible, but remember with two masks, that's 75%. So not N95, but it's not terrible. And most of the two layer masks do better than that. So, um, you know, I think that you could give some guidance to uh, out to parents and, and caregivers and say, this is what we're looking for. You know, a bandana is not gonna cut it, um, but this is what we're looking for. Maybe even put out some models you'd like. You know, there's a, there's a whole bunch now that are actually, you know, they look great for kids and adults um, that have at least two layers, sometimes three layers. And here's where it gets tricky. And this is why it's hard to give a definitive answer. It matters the fabric type. So some are using like, I don't know, polyester with a silk and a cotton with a, and all the different combinations change the efficiency, but, and, and it matters on the particle size. So with the particle size we're interested in, most of the fabrics are gonna capture a lot of the larger particles that create the problem. So imagine coughing or sneezing, the ballistic droplets will be caught for sure, or mostly. Um, and then even if, you know, if you've got 60% effective on each side, um, you're getting up to, what is that, 84% combined efficiency. I'd say that's pretty good. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And it looks like, you know, the, the mechanism by which we think kids are really, one that's been proposed, I think is quite valid on why they transmit less. The younger kids generate less uh, respiratory aerosols or res less as respiratory droplets because they're, they're not fully developed in terms of their alveoli, the, the gas exchange region where a lot of these are formed. So they're actually producing less, it looks like, uh, and lower volume of air emitted. So it um, doesn't mean they shouldn't wear masks, they absolutely should, but at least this is some of the mechanistic reason why we think they're transmitting less. And you will hear people say, you know, the older teens transmit the same as adults. I think that's fair. My reading of the science is a little different. I still think the under 18s are transmitting less, but um, Part of that's wrapped up in that is social behavior is very different, of course, by the age groups. Well, we appreciate your time and being here with us today and giving your insights. And same with you, Mike, for your information. Um, this has just been a, a wonderful, wonderful presentation and day with you. So much appreciated. And thank you for all the good work that you're doing. Yeah, thanks for having me. I, you know, the, one of the most challenging aspects of this whole thing is making sense of the information coming at you. So I know it's really quite hard. I think we all have the same uh, good intentions in place. We want to keep everyone safe, get kids back. Um, and so I'm really appreciative, really, of everything I see that administrators and teachers are doing. It's quite, uh, quite amazing what's happening out there. People are pretty resilient. So I have a lot of faith, even though uh, things don't look so good right now, that uh, we'll get through this okay. So thanks for inviting me and um, glad to hear it was helpful. Okay, thanks. Best to you and your family. Thank you, everybody. I am now calling this meeting adjourned.